So welcome to today's webinar, The Grand Pals Project, Social Impact Through Community Connected Learning. My name is Natasha Pei. I'm the coordinator of communications and logistics for Tamarack Institute's Vibrant Communities Canada. And I'm here to introduce our discussion today with Mark Milho. So in his work as an elementary school teacher, Mark is especially interested in project and service-based learning, in which students achieve curriculum goals while providing significant acts of service to the local community. In keeping with this focus, Mark has been working on the Grand Pals project with different classes for about eight years. Over this time, he has had the privilege of working with many other team members who have been just as passionate about witnessing the magic that can happen when young and elderly have a chance to connect, to share, and to learn. Encouraged by the program's success in many other locations, Mark now sees the potential for Grand Pals to have a broader impact. Schools, libraries, churches, senior centers, service clubs, and other organizations can all be a part um, of bringing forth rich intergenerational programming for the benefit of all involved. So welcome, Mark, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar. Well, thank you, Natasha. So I'm going to make sure my little clicker here works so I can move ahead on the slide. So yeah, we're going to be talking about the Grand Pals project and I want to um, just give you a quick overview right at the start uh, of what I want to touch on today. So I'll do uh, a welcome and an intro and then we're going to talk about what Grand Pals is all about, um, largely from a teacher's perspective at first. So I have four concepts that I want to share with you uh, connected to that. And then we'll also look at its merits from a student perspective. Uh, from the perspective of seniors that would be involved and from a larger community perspective. And uh, lastly, I want to share some resources with you. I mean, all of those resources are on the grandpals.ca website, uh, but it breaks down into connect, plan, engage, and celebrate. And then we have separate resources that help if you are looking to do something similar in your own community. So let me start with um, a warm welcome, especially to the other rural communities out there like like Orangeville. I heard from Natasha that we have some people that have been interested from small communities and so you know I'm high-fiving you. Love the cities too but um, I, I love being a, a rural dweller. I live in uh, Orangeville as I mentioned which is just an hour north of Toronto, Ontario. Um, we have 35,000 people in our town and it's growing but it's still I mean, we still have schools in our community that are surrounded by farmers fields and uh, tractors are running by and cattle and all sorts of things like that. So it's, it's rural and growing just outside of Toronto. Um, in our area, we have some schools that are small and some that are big. I'm at one of the biggest schools in our area. So we have 650 students. But um, likewise, I've worked on this Grand Pals project with schools that are only 100 students in size. So I just wanted to mention that because it's something that can be adapted um, to various communities, to various schools. Um, and in some cases, the schools haven't been involved in all, at all, like it's a, a library that's running something like this. So anyway, a shout out to our, our rural communities. So as Natasha mentioned, I um, have a very specific set of principles that I um, live by as a teacher. And, um, and you know, prior to Grand Pals, I had other projects on the go and they were always community connected. I've always had a leaning that my students, even though they're young, should be learning in connection and interfacing with their community. I just think that that's rich learning, it's necessary learning. Um, and as I reflect on my teaching practice as well, there's always been a service orientation, like that they should be applying their skills to something that is helping out in their community. Um, and so, also in keeping with that, a project-based approach has been part of my pedagogy. And uh, so, you, I mean, you can contrast that to um, maybe a worksheet-based approach or a more solid curriculum, like the projects that they're working on, they're, they're working on a task for a prolonged period of time when they're undertaking the Grand Pals project. And uh, I'm a big fan of Tamarack because I just think that schools can be a hub for vibrant, vibrant communities. Um, and that kids are never too young to be part of that and should be learning that from a young age. So um, anyway, that's been my approach. And um, 2017 was a good year for my self-esteem because, um, you know, as I've been applying these approaches throughout my teaching career, um, they were recognized I, I, in 2017 by our governor general. So here I am shaking uh, Julie Payette's hand um, just after she awarded me the governor general's award for excellence in teaching. So that was exciting. And uh, also that same year, 
that Rotary International awarded me with a Paul Harris Award for community programming. So um, while my approach to school might be somewhat unconventional, it, um, it was kind of nice to have it re recognized in that way and that this, this approach is of value to, um, to, to lots of people. So anyway, moving on here, I just want to set a timer so I don't go over because I get kind of excited about all this stuff and then uh, you know this webinar might go on for quite a while. So let me just get my stopwatch here going so I don't go over time. Um, so, Gram Pals is very simple at its core. What we're trying to do is connect a student in a school, or it might be in a faith group, or you know, a scout group or whatever, to a senior in the local community. And at the core, we're trying to develop friendship, and ideally, we're also trying to foster st storytelling between the two generations. That's it in its simplest form. Um, there are structures, though, in the Grand Pals project built around this core relationship. And the first is um, we provide the seniors ahead of time before the project, once we've gotten them oriented about what the project's all about, with journal questions. And I'll talk more about what these journal questions are like a little bit later, but they're crafted in a particular way. Um, the seniors also are encouraged to bring any kind of memorabilia from their life, artifacts from their life. And um, seniors need to have a certain um, inclination to be part of the project. They have to be willing to walk down memory lane with the students. They have to you know, enjoy being around kids and sharing with kids. So that's uh, on the senior side, some of the important components. And then on the student side, there's a, a lot of pieces as well. So those journal questions are also part of the students' preparation for weekly meetings that they have with their grand pal. Um, as the journal questions start to foster friendship between the two generations, um, the students are introduced to three of their project tasks. So the first one is that they, they are tasked with writing an extraordinary story from their grand pal's life. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of some just extraordinary stories. They also are tasked with developing a proposal, an art proposal. Uh, for telling part of that story through visual arts or other forms of art. Um, and then lastly, they do an oral retelling of that story at our end of project celebration. So all of those tasks take a significant por uh, amount of class time and um, are very much project-based in nature. So um, here is an example of a story and I'm going to share two with you, and I just love this story. So this was written by Owen, and Owen is a 10-year-old, grade 5, top left in that picture with the Metallica shirt on. <laughs> and also you can see a piece of artwork that uh, was featured at our end of project celebration. That's in the forefront there, Cecil, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. And of course, Cecil is there holding a, um, a bandage, which you'll learn more about as I read this story. So let me read this story that was crafted by Owen the 10 year old in Orangeville. During World War II, Cecil was a soldier in the Canadian Army. During one of his missions, he was sent to take over a hydroelectric plant that had been occupied by the Germans. At about 8 a.m. after a night of guard duty, Cecil suddenly heard a buzz bomb turn off above the hydroelectric plant. A buzz bomb flies about 400 feet in the air. It's fueled by gasoline, and when the gasoline runs out, the bomb drops right away. After the bomb dropped, Cecil and another soldier ran down to the nearby canal. A man was carrying a five-year-old girl out of the canal as a shard of glass had hit her in the head. She was covered in blood from head to toe. Cecil immediately ran up to the soldiers who had stayed behind at the plant and asked if they had any first aid equipment to be used on civilians. The soldiers said they didn't, so Cecil had to come up with a new plan quickly. It turned out that all the soldiers had something they called a shell dressing, which was attached to their legs. Soldiers were only supposed to use these dressings on themselves and could get in big trouble if they used them on someone else. At this point, Cecil didn't care about the rule because he really wanted to help the little girl. Fortunately, when the girl was cleaned up, they discovered she had a bad cut, but she was going to be all right. That little girl was very lucky because she could have been yet another victim of a deadly buzz bomb. So um, that is a pretty extraordinary story for a 10-year-old to capture and write down. Um, 
when the students finally brought their final draft of the story back to Cecil, who's sitting there uh, bottom right, you know, he said, boys, uh, now that I think about it, um, I was reissued a bandage after I used that bandage on that little girl and uh, I'll be right back. And so Cecil went upstairs to his room and uh, opened a cabinet drawer that um, I guess he had uh, used about 70 years prior when he first put the bandage in there, took the bandage out and brought it down to the boys. So here they had an artifact connected with their story. And that actually is in fact the, the bandage that, um, that Cecil would have worn along on his leg when he was uh, still in Europe during the Second World War. The, the piece of artwork there that you see in the bottom left is, um, is a portrait obviously of Cecil. But if we were to zoom in on that portrait, you would see that um, the story is actually written into his face. And that particular piece of art was titled by the students, A Story in Every Face, which was a, a beautiful piece of art. And uh, actually Cecil still has that uh, hanging on his apartment wall to this day. So that's one story. And I'm gonna tell you another story just because stories sit really at the core of, uh, of our project. No. So, as I said, Ross met with uh, Isabella throughout the year, and here's the story, and I'll read it to you. Um, in just a second, you'll be able to see a picture of the two of them, and you'll also see something around Ross's neck that I think will be of significance to this story, just like, you know, Cecil and the bandage. When Ross was a child, there wasn't much to do. You could do piano lessons or join Scouts Canada, and Ross decided to join Scouts Canada. Eventually, at the age of 25, Ross became responsible for a scout troop of 36 boys all in their early teens. Together, they decided to walk the entire 885 kilometers of the Bruce Trail. It took them about a year to plan their trip. They would walk the trail in sections. Also, they wouldn't walk in winter, but they would walk in the rain. Yeah, there it is, perfect. In the winter, they would rest up for the new season ahead. It took them about three to four years to finish the trail. One evening, Ross was at home doing dishes when someone knocked on his door. There was a boy standing there in a venturer's uniform. I'm just going to switch over here. Venturer's uniform. A venturer is another group within Scouts Canada. The venturer introduced himself and then started reading a letter from the Governor General of Canada, Jean Sauvé. Ross would be receiving the silver acorn for his especially distinguished service to scouting over the 20 plus years. Ross was so excited that he felt like he was floating two feet off the ground. A month later, Ross was invited to the office of Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Lincoln Alexander, for the presentation of the Silver Acorn. Ross would never have received this award had he decided to take up piano instead of joining Scouts Canada. So there's Ross um, at our end of project celebration with Isabella and around his neck is the Silver Acorn. So, um, and he was pretty honored to have that story retold in public. And of course, in front is her artwork. And she did a map of all the different communities that Ross would have traveled through over those three to four years as he walked that 885 kilometers. So, um, oh good, I've got control to move on to the next slide here, I believe. Okay, so that's a bit of uh, the, the product, I guess, that students and seniors work on together to develop. Now, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of elements of the project. Um, and again, this is from an educator's perspective, and then we'll move into some other uh, vantage points. So make it real. The Grand Pals project makes student learning real. I illustrate this by talking about a play that came out in 1959. It was written by the playwright Samuel Beckett called Waiting for Godot. And this uh, play is basically about two guys that spend the entirety of the play waiting for a guy named Godot to show up, and Godot never shows up to their frustration. And I use this to illustrate what students often can feel in school, and that is that they learn and learn and learn things, and they want to apply it to something real and something meaningful, but that time just doesn't come. And um, as educators, we need to be working uh, to remedy that. So in our project, when we're making all of the strands of the language curriculum real, so reading, writing, media literacy, oral communication, all of that real, students are always applying their learning to the project. So in their reading, they're reading about intergenerational friendship through various texts that, uh, that have become sort of a mainstay for our project. Of course, you saw an outstanding example of student writing, two, ex two ex outstanding examples of student writing. 
in their media literacy, which you know is involves the use of technology and the graphic design and other things. Of course, they're using technology almost every day on this project. And uh, of course, when it comes to presenting their projects orally to a larger group, that also hones their language development skills. So the project makes their learning real. A second principle, combining silos. And I use the following metaphor to explain this portion of the project. Um, here we have two different types of bread. On the left, you've got your uh, standard white bread, and on the right, you've got multi-grain. And of course, the one on the left would have been baked from a single silo and the one on the right from multiple silos. And I would argue that one is more interesting to eat. You could say more nutritious to eat. And so this principle of combining silos um, really applies to creating educational experiences for students. You need to weave together multiple components to make it really interesting and academically nutritious, you could say. So let, how does that actually work out? Well. Of course, I, I talked about how we weave subject strands together into a single project. So their oral communication, reading, writing, media literacy, these aren't taught in isolation from one another. They're brought together um, to create a rich experience, a rich project experience for students. And also the subject areas are brought together. So students aren't sitting in language class and then music class and then social studies. They're in the Grand Pals project learning about language and then they're doing their art. And we actually have a music component to our project where they do uh, a performance at the end of the year. So that's woven in and their social studies is woven in. Um, I'm sharing the bare bones of the project with you, but there's many other pieces that can be woven in. Science, for example, as they learn about the effect of Alzheimer's on the brain, how the body changes with time as you age. So all of that is woven together. And then, of course, we have our local communities that often stay siloed. So students often aren't connected with their local community, where in this case, they're connected with local seniors. We have a, a, our Rotary Club is extremely supportive of our project and so has helped us out financially as well as uh, logistically. And our local business connection, uh, of course, is the Chartwell Montgomery Seniors Residence. So many partners and we're creating uh, an educational experience from many different silos. So a last principle to this project, um, again, from an educational perspective. And um, I would say in education, students are keen and anxious to embrace a cause. They're learning, if it's connected to something meaningful and there's a cause behind it, they are gonna get behind it and you're gonna have engaged students. Um, so our cause is to discover that every person, or to affirm more so, every person is a story. Every person is a story. The students know that we are going to affirm that slogan. And so here I have two boys on the bottom left and they are sharing their artwork with Jim. And both of those pieces of art represent stories from his life. And um, of course, on the, in the middle picture where they're hugging Jim, this is at the end, you can obviously see that there's been a, a friendship connection between them. And on the right, you can see two of our books of stories. So Once Upon a Wednesday is from several years ago. Now and Then was from last year. So these are books of stories that are presented to their grand pal, and it combines all of the stories that were collected during the project. So those two books there represent about 200 pages worth of stories. And um, we're on track to create another 100 page book this year. So that's from an educational perspective. Uh, grand Pals has, um, spread to these various schools in the Orangeville community and has, and has spread beyond actually because I correspond with people further afield as well. So other teachers um, can see that this is, this is powerful learning and are happy to, um, to adopt it and put it into practice in their own school. Okay, so now I'd like to look at the merits of this program from a student perspective. I mean, you saw a bit of that in the slides that I just shared. Uh, from a senior's perspective and then a larger community perspective. So let's talk about students here. Um, within education right now, people are talking about 21st century competencies, and a lot of that connects with social emotional learning. So a 21st century competency is interpersonal skill, uh, is capacity for empathy. So we, I was really curious, uh, and, and some of the other teachers at the other schools were re really curious to know, how does this project affect the social-emotional learning of students? 
And so we got together with uh, an organization in town that um, is sort of a social work agency that helped us develop some metrics around, um, the first one here is consideration of others. The middle one is a sense of empathy over time. And the last one is social consciousness. So a student's ability to um, perceive themselves as capable of affecting positive social change around them. So uh, you can see the results. I mean, we, we gave them the survey before the project and then gave them the survey after the project. And in each on each metric, they, they went up. So that was really positive. I guess now we can brag that we're you know 21st century. But it was really encouraging to see a growth in those areas because that's not something we normally measure in school. Um, but you know maybe we should start measuring more. Anyway, the project had an impact on that. Um, this is this comes from a survey that I gave the students at the end of the project last year. Would you recommend the Grand Pals Gala, or you could say the project to others? Um, we have 97.5 approval rating from students. <laughs> so that's a good sign. And that was consistent with the other schools that did the survey as well. Um, the students were ready to buy into what we were doing. Um, just click on, and here's some anecdotal um, information for you. And this is from Spencer Avenue Public School, and this is from a, a parent. So we got feedback from parents. And I'll read this to you. I think the most valuable part of the Grand Pals experience from Marin was a connection she was able to make with a surrogate grandfather. She lost her papa three years ago and their relationship was very special. He was a school teacher and so they always had a special connection about Marin's school and what types of things she was learning. The relationship she formed with John was so important for her grieving process. She was able to have those academic touch-ins and looked forward to sharing and learning. She was also so excited to see John at our church. As an aside, I think the preparation for the gala was one of the only projects this year that I did not have to ask her to work on. This was done completely on her own. So it's really nice to get that kind of feedback. Um, and again, that, doesn't, that didn't come from students at my school, it came from just an outstanding teacher at uh, Spencer Ave um, and some of uh, the parents connected to her project. So um, I'm moving along here because I don't want to go over time. So the merits from a senior's perspective. Now, I will say that I have some information to share with you on this, but I'm working with a professor from the University of Guelph, which is about an hour away from here. And this is something we're digging into a little bit further. What, what is, you know, can we dig a little bit deeper into what this project means for seniors? But I'll share what I know so far. Um, this is from our, our federal website. So 18% of seniors live alone. Now, interestingly enough, 49% of seniors report feeling lonely, even if they are living with other people. So um, about half of seniors report feeling lonely, regardless of whether or not they have other people that they're in the household with or not. Um, two thirds of the seniors who said they were lonely were either married or living with a partner of some kind. So loneliness, if, if you've got half of your seniors reporting that they experienced loneliness, that's significant, I think. Um, it's also helped to hear directly from seniors that getting out into the community and connecting with students has actually eased their sense of loneliness. So um, I wish I had some anecdotal stuff in writing, but that's been more um, conversational. So I, I love this, um, this cartoon because it, as you can see, it says birth, in between stuff and death. And someone in the audience says, that's it? Um, so while there's humor in that, um, many of the seniors have said that to do a life review with students who gain something from the stories that they've shared, who gain um, either an, a better understanding of history or maybe some life lessons along the way or um, able to compare and contrast their lives currently with what it was like, say, for example, to grow up on a farm in rural Ontario, that has given dignity uh, and here I have it in bold, Grand Pals gives dignity and meaning to a senior's life narrative. So many of the seniors have said, yeah, that life review has been really important. And furthermore, it's been meaningful. So here I, I, I write at the top, this lends credence to the belief that it's not about how many relationships you have, it's about how meaningful they are. So we are trying to create an, an, a meaning that cuts both ways, that there's meaning being created for students and there's meaning being created for seniors. And uh, our, the way we've crafted our journal questions, uh, I mean, it'd be hard to ha talk about um, some of the journal questions without delving into some pretty meaningful topics. 
Um, now, one last thing, and this is data that I got from a survey um, done by our age-friendly council in Orangeville. And the question was, do you feel that adequate community activities are offered to bring multi-generations together? Now, I don't know if the 30% here that said yes took part in a Grand Pals project. I'd be curious to know that. But 30% said yes, while 70% of the seniors surveyed didn't say yes. In other words, they don't, they're not, you know, it's not two thumbs up for, um, for community programming that's intergenerational in nature. So it just goes to show that at least in our Orangeville community, there's work to be done on this front. So speaking of our, our Orangeville community, so now I'm moving on to merits of a program like this from a community perspective. So here is a map taken from the World Health Organization website, and you can see it's our network for age-friendly cities and communities. So these are communities that have been deemed by the World Health Organization as age-friendly. And uh, you can see there's a lot of dots on that map so far. And Orangeville, if you were to zoom in, is one of those dots now, which is kind of exciting for our town. Um, so, but why were they concerned about um, becoming deemed an age-friendly community. Well, here is a quote taken from our Town of Orangeville Age-Friendly Community Action Plan. Um, and I'm just going to read a section. So, a changing population requires a, a plan for change. Seniors are the fastest growing demographic in Canada, creating both opportunities and challenges for municipalities. The number of seniors in Canada is expected to double from 5 million in 2011 to over 10 million by 2036. Orangeville's population shows an aging demographic between 2006 and 2011 censuses. The town's population of adults aged 65 and older increased by about 19%, while the population of children aged zero to 14 decreased by 7% during that same census period. So this is what's happening in Orangeville but it's also something that's happening globally. And so that has many communities starting to think about how they're going to adapt, plan for, change in keeping with changing demographics. Now, when it comes to our town of Orangeville, we have a number of pillars that are supporting our age-friendly uh, council, or sorry, age-friendly community. So it says AFC in the middle of that little flower, so age-friendly community. Um, <laughs> committee. And so uh, here are some of the pillars. So you've got communication and information, uh, community support and health services, housing, outdoor spaces, civic participation, transportation. And then these last two pillars are significant when you're talking about a Grand Pals project. Social participation of our seniors in the life of the community and respect and social inclusion. So Graham, the, the project that we do really uh, facilitate some forward movement on those two pillars that are underlined. So I can see how other communities would be looking to do something similar as they see the same dem demographic changes. Um, moving on. All right, so I have um, some time here just to talk about some resources. So again, these can be uh, found on the website. Um, and uh, the first one, that I'm gonna talk about, and there's a nice video about how to make connections, but the question here is under connect, how might we connect seniors and students? Now, um, this little wheel represents the team that I've always seen come together. So you almost always have a teacher involved who connects with the students, and then you have some member of the community, and that member might come from a diff one of various different organizations that helps bridge that gap to the senior population. And then the teacher and that community representative work together to bring the two generations together. Um, and in some cases I've had, see, I've partnered with seniors to recruit seniors for the project. So that's actually been really helpful because um, they, they do a great job of pitching the program. So uh, residence coordinators, service clubs, public libraries, municipalities, faith groups is one that I don't have up there, but that I've also seen that be really successful. Um, two takeaways, to connect with students and teachers almost always needed as part of a team because this is so interdisciplinary in nature and it's so academic in nature. And uh, to connect with seniors, the team can be more varied. All right, so we're moving on to the plan and engage. So how might we plan for and engage in a project? So here's a bit of a, a waterfall um, 
of, of resources that would help um, to plan, plan for and engage in a project. So I'll talk about these more in detail, but I'll just quickly run over them. So it's important to set the groundwork for the project, and then you move into a phase of discussion and friendship between the two generations. And once that's been established, um, you start to discover the stories, then capture the stories, and then share the stories. And of course, we have a resource that's connected to each one of those phases in a project. Um, so let's talk about groundwork. So here are some of my students working in that groundwork phase. And one of the, the pieces that's built into that building blocks resource is that students talk about big ideas around uh, intergenerational friendship. And uh, the seniors do as well at, at, at our seniors residence. But here they're, they're looking at the big idea of age is only a number. And so students uh, brainstorm about what that means at the beginning of the project and then reflect on it throughout the project and then again do a reflection at the end of the project. So that's one piece of the, of the groundwork. Um, they also look at um, intergenerational friendship, like texts focus on intergenerational friendship, which is also shared with the seniors. Um, the best way to describe this phase is, uh, uh, and this is a colleague of mine, she said, uh, and I believe it's in one of the videos on the site, we're creating the mental Velcro. We're uh, laying the, the, the groundwork so, so as to better understand the overall experience on both sides, both senior and uh, student. Then discussion and friendship. Again, I've mentioned the journals earlier. Um, these are, there, there's many journals that we have. I think there's 25 themes. Um, and these are intentionally crafted to be, uh, as I've said, transgenerational. That here, Al, who's 94 years old in this picture, and Jonathan, who's 10, can both answer a question meaningfully um, so that the conversation cuts both ways. And there's reasons why, of course, crafted them those ways. Uh, discovering stories really quickly. There's um, a number of filters that both seniors and students find helpful when they're sifting through their life narrative to think, you know, to kind of think through, well, what would be a really significant story to tell? Um, that first big idea there, great stories connect with a greater story. Um, so, for example, Cecil's story about the Second World War is a personal story, of course, from Cecil's life, but connects to the larger story of the Second World War. Um, likewise, the, the big idea featured in the bottom right, you know, if you have a story that can help students learn from the past so as to better enter the future, so your past can help me with my future, then you know you've got, you've got a keeper story. So um, seniors and students are working together to sift through and look for a good story. Um, Capturing the stories, um, of course, we do a writing workshop. We're working on developing that resource. But um, another big piece is the works of art, which I talked about earlier. So here's a student looking at various uh, works of art that are on display at the school and being uh, now they're all prepared and we bring those over to the seniors residence for display as well for an entire week. Um, and lastly, there's the celebration piece. Um, and that is where, um, here, let me just fast forward here. The celebration celebration piece, oh, there's a lot of good stuff on the website about that. Uh, many teachers that I've talked to are able just to, to bring together a meaningful celebration without much guidance, but I've had a lot of questions from other teachers saying, you know, maybe you could develop a resource around this. So that, that I want to make a next step. I thought a Gantt chart like this one would be helpful just so, you, so, so people could see how the different project pieces fit together. Um, now this, uh, is uh, over the course of six months. This particular Gantt chart spans six months. I personally think six months is a minimum length. Um, you want to have a good run at a project because you want friendships to develop. Um, and and that just takes time. And then the stories can surface. And so you can uh, look at how those resources kind of come into play throughout over the course of those six months. And of course, that Gantt chart could be extended. And finally, there's a celebration piece. And uh, if you want to know more about what celebration the celebration has looked like at various schools, there's a great video on the site which details that. So um, I'm just being cautious of my time here. I, I know I've hit the 30 minute mark. So I'm going to close with a quote, uh, sorry, an anecdotal piece. I mean, this comes from a parent and um, I think creates a good summary and wrap up for today. So this is from Chris Rogers, a parent from Spencer Ave Public School. The most valuable thing about Riley's grand pal experience was getting to know Isabel. It has helped our whole family 
come to realize that the seniors in our own family have stories and that we rarely take time to ask them about life before we knew them. Riley really enjoyed preparing for the gala and making his speech in front of the group. He worked hard on all, all aspects of it and was very proud to show, us, show it to us and everyone present. I think this was a fantastic program and we've shared it with many of our friends and family. I sincerely hope this program not only continues, but spreads to more schools, as I think it is very beneficial for the children, the grand pals, and all of their families. Great job. So that's where I'll end. I wanted to um, say thank you, Rick. I think that's such a, an interesting or great example of, of a tangible way that we can deepen community, because what you're talking about is not only creating new connections in the community, but really deepening those connections and you know, not just having that surface level interaction, but to reduce um, that sense of isolation and loneliness is really diving into people's stories and connecting them in, in meaningful ways and, and also kind of a fun way, um, a, an interactive way uh, for kids to build that community or to feel like they're part of that community um, and to build social capital. You know, I, I really appreciated those, um, that slide on uh, looking at empathy and levels of, mm -hmm. of consciousness, consciousness and that kind of thing. So it's a great example. Um, I just wanted to move us into the questions period. Um, I'm, I'm taking a look at some of the questions that have come in as we've been going, but wanted to start us off with a couple of uh, the advanced questions that we got. One of them you and I had talked a little bit about, uh, which is a really interesting one. Um, how can this approach be utilized to engage elders in First Nations communities? So Mark, did you want to tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Sure, and I thought that was a really great first question. So to whoever asked that question, thank you. Um, and I'll share, uh, that I spent a lot of time trying to answer that question myself. Um, I met with our program lead in the Upper Grand District School Board, who uh, is, is the lead for First Nations education. I called down to uh, Six Nations um, down in Hamilton, which is about an hour away, to talk to them. Um, I met with, actually, I hope it's okay for me to mention, the daughter of our Premier of Ontario, talked to her. She's married to a, a man who identifies First Nations and her mother-in-law also First Nations, survivor of residential schools. Um, so I was really trying to dig into how could I get this to work because I wanted my students to develop a sense of friendship and empathy, probably friendship the most. Um, so I was looking for that. So. I have not been able to answer this question satisfactorily, um, and I can just tell you where I've gotten so far, and maybe someone else will discover this. But um, so I had one woman who was ready to come in and share some of her stories and get to know some of my students, and decided at the last minute that that she didn't want to do that. And um, I asked her why, and she said, you know, I've had a lot of, and again, she was a survival of residential schooling, and. Um, a life review, in a sense, was one of the last things she wanted to do. There had been so much trauma in her life that she wasn't ready for the experience. And and also, as we talked, she said, I don't know if 10-year-olds are ready for my experience. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting piece that I hadn't, you know, I hadn't fully appreciated, um, that the First Nations communities are dealing with some, some really big things, obviously. And so... I didn't know, that was kind of a hurdle. I didn't know how we would get around. Um, another interesting thing that I mentioned to Natasha earlier was um, I had made an assumption about stories and about how stories get shared or how they get captured by communities. And um, that assumption was wrong. <laughs> so um, I discovered that the concept of elder and story is very particular. And again, I'm talking about what I know I think very little about, but I'll just, I'm sharing what, what, what I've discovered, um, that eldership does not have the same meaning that it would have for other communities. So an elder is a keeper of stories, from what I understand, and provides spiritual guidance to a community through those stories. And so to have a 10-year-old come along and say, oh yeah, I just want to capture those stories and write them down and sort of, you know, they're trying to be sincere, but if there's anything that comes off as cute, that's not going to go well. And so I know that the, the First Nations folks that I talked with were very protective about the concept of story and 
and um, and I ha I realized I had to tread carefully when we were talking about those things because of those those cultural differences. So I'm not exactly sure how uh, you know discovering, capturing, and sharing works, um, but I would really I think those stories definitely need to be told. So um, whoever asked that question, if if you make headway on that, I'd be so curious <laughs> to know how you do uh, because I think it's important. And it's interesting, right? Because this is also this is a template, right? It's um, yeah. it's kind of like what you've created in Orangeville and what some of the other communities have taken on. But it's also not something that has to be prescriptive and that could maybe be adapted in different ways for different communities um, if they're ready to if they're ready and interested in taking that on. Yes, absolutely. And and I want to add to that that when when people are looking to put together a team, um, you will need a teacher that's willing to make those adaptations. You know, to have a, a curriculum that's a little looser, that's going to have to flex for the unique community. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll have to have that mindset going in. Mm -hmm. um, and there were also a couple of questions in the questions box about the about getting the slides, and we will send the slides and the recording afterwards. But there are also some resources on the website uh, to to deliver this kind of curriculum, are there not? Uh, sorry, I was moving on to the second question. So, are there things on the website to, on how to deliver this kind of curriculum? Yes, there are <laughs> templates. Templates on the website. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me about the big word asset-based <laughs> community development. So, okay, yeah. good. That was an easy one. Um, yes. There are resources, not only the videos done by Drew Mori, awesome videographer, did the videos for each of the different phases. So there's a, a kind of a trailer right on the first page and then um, a, a video for both for, for connect, plan, engage and share. Um, but also there's PDFs on there um, that can be downloaded as well and uh, contain, you know, pages and pages. I think there's like 200 pages worth of resources on there. So, and I thought you yeah. did a really great job. I was taking a look at the website um, and I thought you did a really great job of talking about how we start those conversations from e kind of each different perspective that you had talked about, the teacher, the community, um, the students, the seniors, and how you quote unquote sell sell that or make the case. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. they do have, you know, the, the website is full of really rich resources and being, being able to start this in your own community and we can definitely share them out um, after we're done the webinar today. Yeah, um, if I can if I can add one thing to that, the sales job to teachers is really important. I think um, there's a lot of programs out there that are kind of being pitched to schools, and teachers want to know is this is this is the curriculum deeply embedded? Can it be woven into this project? And um, if I was to share some of the report card comments that I put on report cards at the end of the year, all of them tie back directly to the project, and actually it's made teaching easier in some ways report because kids are engaged, number one, we're hitting curriculum requirements. And so for teachers that might be, um, you know, a little bit shy of going that approach, it's it's worth noting that um, you can not only hit those requirements, but actually hit them in a more powerful way, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and, and then the other question that you had alluded to, the other pre-event webinar question was, can you speak to the connection between uh, this Grand Pals program and asset-based community development, that approach. Okay, so just so people know why I'm smiling, I had to say to Natasha, can you just run me through asset-based asset community development? I watched a couple of YouTube videos too, so hopefully I know what I, you know, I have a general idea. But uh, Natasha, maybe, because I had shared that it's uh, with you, that I discovered that the relationship is two-way between the communities and also that you're looking at the strengths of your community prior to getting into developing programming for the community. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. think what you really pulled out for me was that um, this program starts with strengths. It starts with what's strong, not what's wrong. Okay. And rather than looking at um, starting uh, the program or service delivery uh, model with looking at what deficits or needs exist in the community or looking yes. at the capacities, the gifts, the strengths that exist. And, you know, it might not follow um, asset-based community development to a T with all of the different kind of preconditions conditions, but I think it definitely has that element of starting with the assets and identifying or mapping out even the the assets, the gifts that, ex that exist yeah. in Orangeville and in other places. And um, Well, yeah, I think I can speak to this. I, I know um, when we talked earlier, for me, it just seemed ridiculous to have these incredible seniors in our community with all of this rich life experience and capacity for helping young people. I mean, in significant ways, 
both through their, the relationship and friendship, but also from a broadening their perspectives and their horizons, helping them academically. I mean, here we've got huge capacity to help students and we're not tapping into that, <laughs> you know, that like, so we're really missing out. And, um, and you know, demographic changes show that we're gonna have more and more seniors um, that that hopefully can do that or are willing to do that. And I think it's, um, it's necessary. I mean, especially when I think about the needs that the kids have now, many of them are obviously capable when it comes to technology and they can find lots of information. But I would say that there's always going to be the need for direct face-to-face -face mentorship and uh, and for relationship. And so, and that's a really important part of their education. Just because they're in a world of information doesn't mean that they're 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 developing as whole people. And um, and so for me, my passion surrounds that 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 they develop empathy. And that is not something you can just pick up from an online course or a Google search, mm -hmm. right? That's a character trait that's built in. And so um, that's something that our information age can't do on its own. We need those relationships, right? Um, I mean, if I could speak to other elements that have impacted me as a teacher, I mean, one of, one of the, the grand pals that we had in our project happened to be a retired professor of education from the University of Toronto. <laughs> so. So nobody's asking him questions anymore. So I discovered that he, I ran all of my project plans by him and he would help me refine them and, and say, hey, have you thought about this? In fact, the journal questions as they're crafted now come from his mentorship and guidance. Mm -hmm. and, and the way we structure the gala comes from feedback that we've received from the seniors. The field trips that we take the students on with the seniors comes from suggestions that we've gained from the seniors. So when we talk about seniors in our community as an asset, I mean, I could I could ramble on a long time about that, you know, because I've experienced it both personally and then I've seen it happen with students, right? So um, yeah, does that speak to asset-based? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think so. <laughs> okay. And I'm seeing and I'm seeing lots more um, questions come through the questions box. Um, I'll try to run down them kind of in order. The first one, um, and this is one of my questions too, are there any examples of communities who tried to get this program off the ground but weren't successful? Because I think we can learn from the successes as well as um, or the challenges that we've experienced. So what can we pull away from that? Um, Yes. Now, uh, and uh, so I'm just thinking, I have to think through that because one of the great things is that everybody that I've talked to that's tried to do this kind of intergenerational programming has found that there's been some benefit, like there's been more benefit than failure every single time, right? So you go in knowing that there's going to be bumps in the road and um, and and you're going to benefit from something. Now, when we're talking about failure, I mean, there are some difficulties that any project is going to run into. So, for example, Ross, who was featured in the slide, you know, um, so he, the silver acorn, mm -hmm. um, Ross actually wanted to be part of our project this year and started meeting with students, was diagnosed with cancer, and died before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So that's not a failure of the project, but it is a difficult piece for everyone involved to deal with. I mean, I went to <laughs> I went to his funeral. It was the most beautiful funeral, but I mean, it, I found it extremely difficult uh, because I, I had a friend in Ross and I knew the students did too. And when the news got out at the school, the students cried. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, that's not a failure. I mean, I guess in some ways it's an indication of the success if students are responding that way, uh, but it is a difficult piece. There are other failures. For example, there are some seniors that sign up and don't know if they're really going to want to do this and then they absolutely love it. So I, there's a senior this year that at the beginning of the project thought, why am I even here? I'm here because my friend dragged me here. And for about three months just kind of thought, oh, I'm putting in my time. And then it wasn't until she ran into the parents of that student in the community and the parents just went on glowingly about the impact that she was having on their students, on their, <laughs> on their children, that she she was able to perceive that the project wasn't a failure, that it there was significant social capital being built. 
And now she, you know, when I see her come in on Wednesday, she just bounces in and is, is upset if she misses five minutes of the interview time together, right? So um, you can have that. And then, and then you have the opposite where seniors come in really enthusiastic and then they quit halfway. And that, that's really hard on students. I had one student that happened to this year and he was really upset about the whole thing because he thought something was wrong with him. You know, I had to explain, no, I mean, in this case, um, the person's health was deteriorating and he didn't want to, I mean, he, he was, he was, he wasn't able to keep showing up. I mean, from a health perspective, right? So those are some bumps in the road that I think happen. And I think the last piece is teacher capacity. So project-based learning or doing a project like this requires a different skill set than you might normally be used to as a teacher. And uh, I heard, um, I read a, a, an article from a professor at the University of Brock that was talking about if we're moving towards more project-based learning, um, some of the skill sets required for teachers are akin to project management. And I know that some of the teachers that have had difficulty um, really just haven't had time to hone their project management skills. And some of the ones that have done extremely well come from a project management background. Um, or in one case, was a chef and a caterer. And so in my mind was really great at, at pulling off projects, you know? And so when I saw her uh, project unfold or the grandpa's project unfold at her school, I was amazed by the attention to detail and the forward planning and, the, you know, thinking through scenarios and stuff. So that uh, I think is another way of, of um, pushing off failure. Although, you know, the whole community learns from undertaking something like this, I think, so. And, and you know what you were saying about um, some of the seniors passing on or not continuing with the program. It, it's also skill built. You know, it's incredibly sad and, and oh, yeah. for that loss, you know, whether it's somebody passing on or not continuing with the program um, for kids to experience that. I think it's also, you know, there's a certain set of skills that you build with that kind of experience and um, going through that grief, going through that loss, um, as long as it's supported in the right in the right yeah. way too um and there are lessons that they're able to to be supported to to learn from that yeah my my piece of advice by the way i think it should be added and i've learned this the hard way um is if one of the grand pals passes away and there's a there's a deep relationship that's happened um and again in this particular case with ross i mean he really took on a grandfatherly figure for the the kids in his group and so they didn't get to the funeral. And I think it's really important for, and I went to the funeral and it was just hard to get them because of scheduling. But I think as much as possible, try to have students attend for a sense of closure. Mm -hmm. and, and like what you're talking about, um, you know, that there's, there are certain things that are gonna be learned through that experience. I know that hearing the stories uh, told about his life at the funeral shaped me. So I was thinking, that obviously would have an impact on the students. And I, I regretted that I, I didn't just kind of do everything possible to get them there. I mean, it was a, it was a brutal snowstorm that day for one, I barely made it, but you know, I, th I think if possible, anyone who's undertaking something like this should be aware that this can happen and to make sure that that closure piece is possible, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and before we wrap up, I just wanted to to bring up that actually an Indigenous woman um, from Owen Sound, which is uh, it sounds like just an hour north of you, Mark, uh, wrote yeah. in um, saying that she can assist with the questions regarding um, working with First Nations. Um, Sorry, say that she, she's the one that submitted that question. Uh, I'm not sure if she submitted it, but uh, she said she could speak to it a little bit, and she wrote in. Um, that elders are also seniors. It has to do with life experience. Um, there are not, there may not be any cultural knowledge, um, but she's referring to people 60 and over, regardless of culture, um, are elders, they've earned it. Uh, then she yeah. went on to say that when talking with elders, make certain that you're asking them to share their personal stories, not their cultural stories. Okay. Uh, which, which can make a big difference. Okay. Um, and like all elders that partner up with stu students, there will be traumatic stories that they will share. Yes. Um, and the care needs to be taken with elders prior um, and make certain that what they're sharing is age appropriate. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. thank you for thank that. You. Um, yeah. and, I would, and I would encourage, you know, to, that you, you, might be want, you might want to be in contact afterwards and I can absolutely sure. um, 
connect you to if you'd like to continue that conversation. Um, looking at the time, we do have to move into a couple of closing announcements, but thank you, Mark, for sharing the okay, Grand Health project you. with us, and we'll be sure to share the, the PowerPoint and the recording and all of the resources that you can uh, take a look at afterwards. Okay, um, well, so thank you. I just want to encourage everybody to stay in touch with us. Um, with Deepening Communities, uh, you will be able to receive the latest thinking news and tools from the, the Deepening Communities community by subscribing to our bi-monthly newsletter um, or visiting the online learning community for poverty uh, for Deepening Community Practitioners at www.tamarackcommunity.ca. Um, and if you move to the next slide, um, we also have an upcoming webinar. Um, if you would like to uh, join us to look at how um, we can build the, the idea of community into our neighborhoods again. Um, join us there with Jim Deers and Paul Bourne, two you know, thought leaders in community engagement. Um, they will be back with us next month. So you can register at the bottom. The link is there and we will send it to you in the follow up. If you move to the next slide, uh, you can also learn with us in person. Um, we will be in Vancouver in just a few weeks, June 12th to 13th. You can learn about all of the different ways cities are innovating to reduce poverty uh, with our Western Regional Summit. So the event information is below as well as the registration. We would encourage you absolutely to register as soon as possible. If you are a Cities Reducing Poverty member and you have not used your two free seats yet, please contact Lena at tamarackcommunity.ca. And if you go to the next slide, we have a community change festival coming up. This is Tamarack's signature um, event of the year, and it's, it will be held in Toronto, Ontario this year in the fall, October 1st to 4th. Um, it is four days, and you will explore those five competencies that every change maker needs to move from uh, to move from ideas to practice to impact. Um, you will learn in so many different ways through workshops, open space dialogue. Uh, you'll explore tours, uh, tools, and go through peer-to-peer -peer input processes. Um, so if you would like to register to learn more about that event, you can use the link at the bottom and that will be sent to you in the follow-up as well. If you move to the next slide, uh, we just want to say another big thank you to Mark and to everyone who participated on today's call. We will send those resources to you in just a couple of days um, and we hope to see you again soon. So have a great day.